The topic of this conference is one that matters a great deal to me, and I think uh, we are only beginning to understand how much there is to find out about, and uh, what I vaguely understood about the implications of the new technologies for communication, I now see much more vividly, and I think there is in Europe, and I hope also in North America, a huge move within the academic world to try to think more seriously of not just about trustworthiness and trust but also about uh, the, the ethics of data governance and data management. These are going to be very preoccupying and difficult things. Now I think that probably we most of us agree that trusting others or institutions is only valuable when it's directed could I have the light please thank you <laughs> uh, uh, when it's directed to agents and active I, I'm not quite sure whether we're meant to be having a light show but uh, <laughs> certainly if the lights turned out I can't see to give this lecture uh, so could we please keep it on? Um, Trusting is valuable only when it's directed to agents and institutions that are trustworthy, like the lighting system. <laughs> For example, think of all those people who trusted the very well-known Mr. Madoff, who then made off with their money. And they th it would hardly have been consoling for them to think, well, at least I was trusting. After all, far better if they had not been trusting, had not invested their money in his Ponzi scheme. Our aim, everybody's aim, is surely to trust the trustworthy, but not the untrustworthy. Now, I find this an elementary point, and it makes it puzzling, at least to me, that so much contemporary investigation and discussion of trust and levels of trust says little, sometimes nothing at all, about what it takes to direct trust to trustworthy institutions and persons, or to direct mistrust to untrustworthy institutions and persons, because surely we want to do both. But as soon as we acknowledge that what matters most is being able to judge trustworthiness and lack of trustworthiness, it surely becomes clear that it's not enough to investigate generic attitudes. It's important to take questions about evidence, about expertise, about professionalism, and their bearing on trustworthiness seriously. Hence the importance of this conference. And yet the claim that you need to think as much about trustworthiness as about trust is still contested. Michael Gove, former Lord Chancellor in the UK, notoriously said in June 2016, during the Brexit referendum <coughs> campaign, that people have had enough of experts. But what he said was not quite what the newspapers reported because, in fact, one can tell from the interview on Sky News, which you can still look at, that he'd begun a longer sentence and we, never, we don't know how it would have finished. He'd begun to say something quite specific, but he was interrupted by a particularly hectoring interviewer. Gove has subsequently said that what he had intended to say was that the public have had enough of economists, of experts who give economic advice. Um, well, we could all giggle at that, particularly the economists here, um, <laughs> and remember the quip that where there are six economists, there will be seven opinions, and two of them will be Mr. Keynes's. <laughs> but it's the literal and uncharitable reading of Gove's remark that is making the headlines and the running in many political and other debates about the idea that we live in, I quote, a post-factual or post-truth era, and in disputes about who's peddling not merely the occasional bit of misinformation or even exaggeration or lie, but pervasive fake news and all too often who is promoting combative and dismissive views of supposed expertise, including scientific and professional expertise. For these, as well as for less important reasons, I think we need to think very carefully and critically about claims to expertise and about trust in experts. I don't know whether it's something I'm doing that's affecting the electricity, because... <laughs> it's motion sense, so I'm trying to move uh, around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try. Um, 
As I see matters, we indeed need to address several distinct but linked issues. We need in the first place to be vigilant in distinguishing between others, sorry, trusting others, including experts, truth claims, trusting others, including expert commitments to do what they've undertaken to do, and trusting others, including expert competence to meet those commitments. If I trust journalists' claims about President Trump or Mrs May, for example, I'll be placing trust in the honesty and truth of the claims journalists make about them. In this case, for the most part, empirical truth claims. Of course, they may be, in some cases, false empirical truth claims. By contrast, if I trust my bank to send me a monthly statement of account, I trust their commitment to do so. And if I trust my dentist to extract a tooth, I trust her competence, her expertise, skill and good judgment that she will bring to the extraction. I will, of course, assume that my bank and my dentist also accept certain truth claims. Uh, for example, that the address I have provided is correct, or that it is the right upper wisdom tooth that needs extracting. But my trust in their future performance is not based solely or mainly on my belief that their truth claims are honest or indeed <coughs> accurate, but rather on judgments about the commitment or reliability on the one hand and the competence or expertise on the other that they will bring to action. The distinction between placing trust in others' truth claims on the one hand and in their commitments and competence on the other is an instance of the standard philosophical distinction between two directions of fit. In trusting or mistrusting others' truth claims, we aim to judge whether those claims fit or do not fit the world as it is. In trusting or mistrusting others' commitments or their competence, we aim to judge whether their action will live up to their commitments and whether it will achieve the relevant standards of competence. The first direction of fit is empirical and the second is normative. The first aims to report on the world and the second to judge whether action meets or will meet relevant norms. Inter alia, norms of honesty, norms of reliability, and norms of competence. The importance of both directions of fit is evident in the traditional view that to be trustworthy is to be trustworthy in word and in deed, both in truth claims and in action. I want to say a little bit about placing and refusing trust intelligently because I think for, uh, in everyday life and in professional life that is pretty basic. It's useful, I believe, to focus in the first instance on relatively low-key claims to mistrust, mistrust specific claims or specific commitments made by certain experts, professionals and institutions and to set aside hyperbolic claims to mistrust all experts or all expertise. I mean, one does meet those claims, but uh, I think blanket claims to mistrust experts are often exaggerated, even silly, and may not fit with the views or action of those who make them. Those who claim that they trust nobody generally seem to accept that some people know more about certain matters than others, that some people have a better record of reliably living up to their commitments than others, and that some people are more competent and skilled in specific matters than others. They generally prefer, for example, to have an expert surgeon rather than their next door neighbour remove their grumbling appendix, or an expert plumber rather than the surgeon to fix their water supply when the tap uh, starts leaking. Most people, in short, discriminate between cases and seek to place warranted trust in specific claims commitments and competence, but not in others. No doubt they seldom look for detailed evidence, which is epistemically quite demanding, or no doubt they often rely on quite approximate reputational evidence and heuristics. No doubt quite a lot of reputational evidence is flaky and some of it is fraudulent. No doubt indeed there are people who are spending lots of money in creating fraudulent reputational evidence. What is PR for? Mm -hmm. Yet few people doubt that some know things that others don't, that some honour their commitments even if others don't, and that some have practical expertise that others lack. 
So when we start talking about experts, I think it's pretty useful to think dentists, think car mechanics, think plumbers, uh, don't just think economists in short. <laughs> Now, our problem is not that no distinctions can be drawn between trustworthy and untrustworthy persons and institutions, or those we have no evidence and no or that we have no evidence or heuristics for drawing these distinctions in everyday life. We don't, in fact, live in a post-truth society in which truth claims don't matter to us, or are all faked, or nobody meets their commitments, or in which we can be indifferent to practical expertise. Our problem is rather that it's often hard and time-consuming to find a basis for trusting specific claims, commitments and competences, particularly when complex technologies and institutions influence, shape and on occasion distort and falsify the evidence we can obtain. Placing and refusing trust intelligently is demanding and it leaves opportunities for those who seek to push false claims, to fail in to meet their commitments, or to pretend to competence and expertise that they lack. Luckily, however, it is usually feasible every day. But even there, I think when we're honest, we all know of people who aren't very good in everyday matters. They're poor judges of trustworthiness in daily matters. They persistently adopt false or unwarranted beliefs. They persistently take palpably unreliable undertakings at face value. And they persistently fail to detect or ignore, which is more interesting, evidence of lack of competence. I think that is one of the topics uh, that the sort of work we're hearing reported at this conference uh, uh, most needs to engage in, namely why persistently um, misplaced trust is favoured and what is the driver for it, because so often it is injurious to those who misplace it. Not always, but so often. But I think problems are far more likely to arise, not in familiar circumstances, but in judging expert truth claims, expert commitments, expert competence, particularly when expertise is institutionally and technically mediated and involves numerous parties and sometimes pretty arcane expertise. Although it can be hard to judge expert claims and their commitments and their competence, there are, however, steps that can be taken. And I shall comment briefly on a few of them on some of the possible shortcomings of steps that have been taken and on some remedies that bear on linking trust to trustworthiness in complex settings. So let me say a little bit about challenges to truth claims. There are, I think, many measures that support the intelligent placing and refusal of trust in truth claims, including in complex and arcane truth claims, such as we find in scientific and other specialised and professional activity. And some of them have, of course, been discussed and refined across centuries, not only in accounts of scientific method and inquiry, but also in wider discussion of epistemic standards and in ways of securing legal certainty and institutional property. This is not novel territory. And I'm not going to comment on the current state of uh, discussions of these issues, but I will say a little bit about challenges to inquiry that come from directions that have on the whole little to do with scientific, expert or professional methods, but quite a lot to do with the structures and organisations for uh, using that evidence. As I read it, what's going on is that many challenges are not to the methods, but to the organisation of scientific and other expert practice and to problems and occasionally indeed to perverse incentives that they create. Mm. However, one challenge which I single out because it is of a different sort is based on a deeper mistake about what science and other parts of expert inquiry can offer. And I think that this was touched on once or twice during the day. This objection is that scientists and other experts should not be trusted because, look, some of their claims are later qualified or shown to be untrue and are retracted. This is absolutely true, but it's also beside the point. Science and other forms of expert and rigorous inquiry do not purport to have algorithms for generating truths, let alone the complete truth, as anybody who thinks that there can be scientific progress 
or progress in other specialized knowledge and practice realizes. In scientific work, in other fields of expertise, earlier results are expected to be rejected or refined if the evidence so requires. There's nothing new in that. The hallmark of proper use of scientific and other rigorous methods is that findings can be subject to further test and possible falsification. Not that every well-documented scientific finding will support a generalized truth for all time. Science aims at well-supported truth claims, not at infallibility, in the, and uh, can progress because the results of new research and other expert investigation remain the results of research and other expert investigation remain open to revision and rejection in the light of evidence. But in the present climate of opinion, I would also enter one caveat here. I think it's very important to insist that checking and challenging is not just a ma matter of contradicting or denying scientific claims yeah. without providing any evidence against them. And one of the issues that I think arises with some of the examples we were discussing earlier this afternoon is um, that people whose uh, stock in trade is simple, simply denial or rubbishing uh, get uh, a hearing, whereas the proper way to engage with them, though of course they may likely refuse to engage, is to say, okay, what is the evidence? Uh, could we perhaps look at that evidence? Could you tell me where it is published? Could you tell me what its source is? Can we look at the, uh, the evidence more closely? However, let me leave that one aside. It's a very distinctive set of issues. I think most controversy and confusion arises from disagreements that begin not with differences about scientific or other rigorous or professional methods of inquiry, but from issues to do with the organization and structures that support the commitments and reliability of some scientists, some experts, some professionals, and about their competence. I'm going to offer just a couple of examples. There are, of course, very many examples. One's from scientific research. It is a problem and a worry that a lot of non-reproducible results are published in scientific journals. Although one might hope that further research could eliminate or reduce the problem, that research may not be undertaken, often for very good reasons. It may be expensive, it may now be clear that it would be unfruitful, um, and um, it may just be that other more fruitful approaches have now been found. Many think that more non-reproducible results are now being published. I'm not sure how robust that evidence for that is. I look at Luke, of course, more results are being published, so probably non, more non-reproducible <laughs> results are being published. But whether there's a higher proportion of non-reproducible results being published seems to me to be um, something that probably we don't have very good evidence on. After all, um, uh, not every result that is non-reproducible, a dispositional term, is going to be tested to see whether it's really non-reproducible. If there's good evidence, however, I suspect that it reflects specific features of our organization of research, such as excessive incentives to publish, uh, where uh, you know, nowadays I look at the uh, um, uh, amount of publication someone needs for their first lectureship, it resembles what people used to uh, need in order to be promoted to a readership or even a chair. It, it's uh, been in greatly inflated. Um, also, the, uh, the irresponsible proliferation of online journals that don't meet adequate or perhaps any standards of uh, peer review. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in getting almost daily invitations to publish in journals, of which I've never heard, in fields I know nothing about, <laughs> <laughs> with an indication of quick and by implication unconditional publication. Um, needless to say, they get trashed immediately, uh, but I can see the temptation this creates for people. At least they may think I'd have a publication. Uh, and the institution would have to take that seriously. And then there is the fact that we probably have 
some inadequate ways of dealing with conflicts of interest. I don't say inadequate ways of dealing with declarations of interest, which I regard as quite a separate matter. Declarations of interest are routine matters which one keeps uh, online and updates every month or two to make sure one hasn't forgotten something. But dealing with conflicts is complex mm -hmm. and I, uh, I institutionally demanding, demanding for one's senior colleagues, demanding for oneself. And I think that does bear more attention. Mm -hmm. But the fact that non-reproducible results are published and then not challenged doesn't, I think, demonstrate the inadequacy of scientific or other rigorous methods for reaching truth claims. It simply points to failings in the commitments or competence either of specific researchers or of specific research organizations or funders. The fact that some conflicts of interest are not detected or not managed rigorously doesn't show that scientific inquiry is untrustworthy, but it points to issues that I think we acknowledge needs, need addressing. But other problems seem to me are not immediately connected to failings in scientific or other expert commitments or competence. Many of them arise from the shift to online communication. The shift has had great advantages, not least for scientific and expert work. It reduces the cost of publication, it broadens the dissemination of findings, but it comes at a very high price. The digital revolution has undermined some traditional systems of quality control. It's made it easier to bypass expert gatekeepers. It offers opportunities to anonymous or non-competent actors whose credentials and competence cannot be checked by anybody. It has unsurprisingly encouraged the proliferation of truth claims that have not been checked, may not be backed by any expert, professional or institutional commitments or competence or by any solid evidence. And while the opportunistic so-called journals that solicit articles but don't peer review what they publish may be traceable to identifiable publishers, I'm actually not sure how widely that is the case and I don't know whether it would be discoverable. Um, there's no constraint at all on the anonymized proliferation of unsubstantiated and unattributed truth claims that multiply without check or challenge in the online echo chambers of social media or are algorithmically recirculated. And I think we need to start taking these issues very seriously. So, challenges. One might have thought, one might have hoped, that the multiplication of unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated truth claims would have been stemmed by the ambitious regulatory revolution of the last 40 years. That revolution, those revolutions, have aimed to hold experts, professionals and institutions to account and to require them to communicate honestly, to live up to the commitments they've made and, of course, to perform to required standards of competence. These strengthened requirements range from increased financial audit to tougher accreditation of institutions and of individual professionals, from complex... I, I think it was ju just brief, uh, to uh, complex health and safety requirements, to more demanding requirements for institutional governance, from requirements that individuals declare their interests and procedures for dealing with conflicts. And yet, many think, although I don't think they have uh, clear evidence, that trustworthiness has declined and that purported experts, professionals and institutions have not met their co uh, commitments or not done it all the time, not shown adequate competence or not all the time, and are even dishonest. But my suspicion is that much of the perception that experts, professionals and institutions are now less trustworthy doesn't reflect clear evidence of increased untrustworthy behaviour, but rather the fact that proliferating regulatory requirements define and detect more types of failure, which receive more time and more attention. Now, those who try hardest to meet more and more detailed requirements may spend more time meeting those requirements and less time engaging with their professional community, with those whom they are meant to serve, or with the wider public. They may appear to be following some incomprehensible 
and hostile agendas that incur attitudes of suspicion and mistrust. That is one of the possible unintended consequences of this revolution. If we need if we seek to link trust to trustworthy claims, commitments and competence, I think we need to focus not on generic attitudes, but on ways to secure expert professional and institutional performance without imposing the sorts of safeguards that actually distort performance. And that's no easy task. And by the way, I think it cannot be secured by saying, oh, what we need is greater transparency so that it's easier to detect and deter failings. Transparency has become a very fashionable remedy for the last 40 years or so. It's seen as a requirement to place information in the public domain. And of course, it can deter sloppy behavior. But it's a pretty limited remedy. It's easy to place information in the public domain um, in the online world, remarkably easy. But it's hard to ensure that uh, it is, in practice, accessible to those for whom it might be valuable, intelligible to them if they happen to find it, and accessible by them if they find uh, and understand it. Uh, all of that we dealt with at some length in a Royal Society re report called Science as an Open Enterprise, and I still regret that we couldn't find, uh, uh, what shall I say, a uh, snappier terms than uh, uh, accessibility, intelligibility, and accessibility, but that's what we meant. While transparency is a useful incentive for experts, professionals, and institutions, it's, I fear, likely to share the shortcomings of the wider regulatory revolution of which it, after all, forms quite a significant part. Let me finally turn to communication media and communication intermediaries. I seem to be specializing in unpronounceable phrases today. <laughs> Many suspect that the recent surge of claims about the untrustworthiness of experts reflects our increased reliance on digital communications technologies. I think the problem may not lie with the technologies themselves, but with the disruption to practices and standards of communication that their helter-skelter introduction has produced. These technologies te en enable voluminous, remote, anonymous dissemination of speech content. Nothing easier. But they can make it much harder for listeners, readers, and for that matter, viewers, to tell who is speaking, who is writing, to tell what the speech act is, what is being communicated, or how it is being shaped by invisible intermediaries. I believe that it is the intermediaries rather than the technical media that we need to concentrate on. And when I say the intermediaries, I mean, of course, to cover far more than the media, meaning the institution of the press. The ethics of communication bears on speech acts rather than speech content. And digital technologies offer unsurpassed ways of disseminating content, but they often obscure whose speech act is being disseminated. They make it harder, not easier, to judge trustworthiness in some cases. So my sense is the technologies are not the problem, nor are our agreeing and implementing technical standards for the use of the technologies. That goes on. But I think the ethical standards that matter for communication and for judging whether others' speech acts are honest, competent, and reliable are being massively disrupted and need rebuilding. Seemingly direct and unmediated, even intimate communication may emanate from undeclared sources whose honesty and reliability and competence we cannot check and cannot judge. Seemingly professional and expert claims may misrepresent or falsify, may have been plagiarized or invented, may be circulated and recirculated by unknown others whose honesty, competence, and reliability is not accessible. Of course, these te uh, co technologies have charm and advantages, but they've also disrupted our capacities to judge standards of communication and of its trustworthiness. Structures structures and practices of communication that worked really rather well in the world of print, 
where we drew a distinction between authors, printers, and publishers, and established uh, uh, legislation defining their relative responsibilities, still have no online parallels, and there are those who, in my view, misguidedly think that it would threaten freedom of expression if there were online parallels. I do not think we think that the, uh, the legislation that bears on publication, on defamation and the like, disrupts freedom of expression using print. So I think there's a long way to go. At present, there is no re reliable distinction, no uh, legally ascertainable distinction between online platforms and online publishers and no legal clarity about their respective responsibilities. And uh, I think it's not surprising that it's become hard to, to link trust to trustworthiness when the basic signposts, the communicative practices, and the liabilities that we need to define are simply left in limbo. Thank you.